Okay. Welcome everybody to our second public lecture of this new academic year. Uh, we hold these talks every Thursday at 5 p.m. Of course, this year, and out of concern for safety, we're offering these lectures in a hybrid format. It's a bit awkward, as you can see, but it gives more people an opportunity to participate and it keeps all of our friends and family love uh, safe. So you might have noticed that we skipped our lecture that was scheduled for last week because we were all trying in our own way to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Osage peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. But today we're back at it and very excited to feature one of this year's visiting research fellows. Our visiting scholars stay between a week and a year and allow us to connect with ideas and intellectual communities we might otherwise not encounter. For those of you who are watching on Zoom or on YouTube, I welcome you. In particular, I would like to encourage Zoom uh, participants to pose questions in the chat function once we enter the discussion period toward the end of the lecture. I will explain later how that works, but um, at our first event with John Tatamano a couple of weeks ago, uh, we found that it worked exceptionally well. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Dustin Banak, who's a visiting assistant professor of practical theology at George Truett Theological Seminary at Baylor University in Texas. Prior to his work at Baylor, he worked at Duke University. He completed his PhD in 2020 at Duke University's Divinity School in North Carolina, where he worked on a dissertation that he's turning into his first book entitled Adaptive Change, A Practical Theology of Faith, Community and Change in the Pacific Northwest. Although he graduated a year ago, he's al he already has an enviable publication track record. As some of you may know, our most recent book on the, uh, out of the CSRS is on the Cascadia bioregion. So I know many of us are really eager to hear the way a practical theologian like Dustin reflects on the peculiar features of this region. And there are many peculiar features. And so with that, I wanna step away from the actual and digital lectern and ask you to join me in welcoming Dustin Binak. Thank you, Dr. Bramadat. It's uh, wonderful to be here with you, uh, both in person and online. Uh, grateful to see your faces, grateful for the hospitality, uh, thank grateful for the curiosity that fills this space. But although my time with you at UVic will be far too short, uh, one of the things that's been striking, even in this brief time, is uh, how it's stunning that there is such a place in the world where uh, the beauty and grandeur of the environment is rivaled only by the intellectual curiosity of this particular community. Uh, so it truly is a joy to be with you. Thanks for your kindness. Thanks for your hospitality. And I look forward to your conversation today. As a researcher, scholar, and practical theologian, I have the privilege to listen to and tell the stories of community of faith and their leaders. Stories have power. They have the power to change how we view our world, our place in it, and imagine what is possible. We also are stewards of stories and stewards of places. When combined, they invite us to become actors in the world and help us imagine and possibly even reimagine what is possible. Lovely. Yeah. That's what's possible. Uh, so today, if, if you'll let me, I want to tell the story of two communities that points to what's possible when we explore the power of collaborative partnerships. As cities, neighborhoods, and communities and cities uh, respond to the shifting texture of religious life in the Pacific Northwest, Cascadia, and beyond, collaboration is required. And far from abstract expressions, the story of collaborative partnership is first placed local and contextual. To this end, I want to set the scene by taking you to an ordinary, out-of-the-way town, Spokane, Washington. In a Tuesday morning conversation I had about what's possible when leaders and communities of faith find themselves gathered on the edge of Christendom. On a Tuesday morning in September, I wandered down a two-way street towards a multi-purpose coffee shop situated in a Spokane neighborhood. 
Although once a booming agricultural and economic center located between Minneapolis and Seattle, Spokane is a town that still feels like it has the dirt of a previous decade hanging on it. It is humble, overlooked, but also incredibly beautiful. It's the antithesis of Seattle and Vancouver, these self-identified global and futuristic cities. And it's precisely this ordinary, out of the way feature of Spokane that has drawn me to this particular city and this particular neighborhood. A bell chimes, I cross, I cross a black and white floor and then enter into a multi-purpose space. It's a space that is at once a coffee shop and a local congregation. This is the gathering house as visualized here, which is one of many local place-based ecclesial experiments that are popping up across the Pacific Northwest. Here, in this out of the way coffee shop, a community is trying to imagine what is possible together in this particular place. I've come for a conversation with Bob. Uh, Bob is a nonprofit leader in the region. He's not the pastor entrepreneur who rounds and founds this place. Rather, he is someone who has been gathered here. Fittingly, it seems that we've both been gathered in this place at the gathering. Bob is a church planner and a regional leader based in Spokane. He has served internationally with church planting organizations, but he's now returned to Spokane to cultivate what he calls a more rooted life. He's the catalyst of change and creativity. He's what I call an ecclesial entrepreneur who, quote, wants to try to change the mind of the church. And part through our conversation, we are interrupted by the owner of the store. This pastor barista comes over to greet us, says hi to Bob, who's a friend, and welcomes us into the space. As we do so, I'm reminded that alongside the aroma of coffee beans, friendship fills the air. Over our conversation, Bob, Bob talks about his journey as a church planter and ministry leader towards choosing partnership over the nimbleness that independence provides. And without denying the need for change, he describes how the hope of the world comes only from relational embeddedness. And then he shares a phrase that becomes a through line for my research and this conversation. We're better together. Reflected of the particular place we sit, surrounded by others and welcomed by this local pastor barista, the phrase shimmers which with imaginative possibility. We're better together. It leads me in that moment to think, who is the we that is gathered in this place? Is this a porous collective we that's emerging on the edge of Christendom? What are the means by which we are gathered in this space? What are the practices, religious, social, and otherwise, that constitute and reconstitute a common life in this particular space? And then finally, together. What does it mean to be together in a space and in a time when the very boundaries that organize a common life are shifting so quickly? We're better together. It is as if these ordinary everyday connections have become sites of discernment and wonder for Bob as well as myself. I begin to recall resonances with other conversations I've had with leaders across the region in coffee shops in Seattle, executive suites in Vancouver, Washington, neighborhoods in Portland, back porch conversations by Zoom, meetings with Catholic priests in Bellingham, conversations with mainline pastors in their local congregation. And although, although the context and conversation may differ, they share a fundamental conviction that there is a boundary crossing gathering that is emerging in the region that we really are better together. But there is more. In this ordinary space of this Tuesday encounter, in this out of the way coffee shop, on this out of the way street, and in this out of the way town, Bob has named the local wisdom that is rising up across communities to remake the very structures that govern Christian communities and the practice of leadership within them. Representing more than a strategic partnership, excuse me, strategic intervention in a shifting religious economy, their work represents an attempt to craft and pursue a particular way of life. 
So today, I want to illustrate and argue that the priority of togetherness described in this Tuesday morning encounter reflects an approach to collaborative partnership as a way of life. I'll do this in three moves. First, I'll provide a brief introduction to my research in Cascadia and the Pacific Northwest. I'll then describe the forms of collaborative partnership and leadership that is emerging in the region. And then I'll conclude by considering how collaborative partnership, when embedded in a broader community of practice, represents a particular way of life. My engagement with Bob and similar leaders across the region occurred over the course of three phases of research. Uh, given the nature of, of this particular conversation in this particular place, I'm mindful that I should say something briefly about how I understand and define Pacific Northwest. Uh, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho were the primary geographic centers for my research. And although collaborative partnership extends beyond the region and led me to interview pastors across Canada and Vancouver and in other parts of the, the United States, I tried to stay rooted in the particulars of this place. Along the way, I found Tim Timothy Egan's definition of the Pacific Northwest helpful. Quote, the Pacific Northwest is simply this, wherever the salmon can go. Similarly, I held loosely to the geographic boundaries, recognizing that religious life in the region and particularly the collaborations that comprise it runs much like the salmon without neat boundaries or constraints, but it always runs in the company of others. To that end, the first phase of my work included a network analysis that combined interviews with diverse stakeholders in the region and a review of grant making patterns. Based on this work, I identified two critical cases where individuals across different types of organizations are linking arms and gathering together in collaborative ways. Specifically, identify the Office of Church Engagement, which I'll call the OCE, and the Parish Collective, the PC, as hubs. The OCE merged out of the Reform tradition and is rooted in Spokane. Uh, the PC, meanwhile, emerged out of the missional emergent tradition in Cascadia and now has a global network. At the time, I didn't have a precise definition for this category, hub. I simply sensed that some novel ecclesial activity was happening in these conjunctive and collaborative spaces. I'll define hub in a moment, but I first wanna talk about phase two and phase three. The second phase included an egocentric analysis based on semi-structured interviews with 38 individuals across these hubs. I attended conferences and I reviewed literature produced by organizers and participants. Interviews with organizers and participants specifically explored the challenges they face, the values that inform their engagement, and the particular expressions of leadership that guide their collaborative and adaptive work. And then in the third phase, I completed follow-up interviews with a subsample of participants in the wake of COVID-19. I also convened organizers from each hub for a gathering that I called a convocation of ecclesial entrepreneurs. In total, I engaged more than 60 interview, inter, individuals in interviews or focus groups, reviewed thousands of pages of published documents, and made multiple trips to the region. Before describing the structure of collaborative partnerships, I wanna say a brief word about the significance of the Pacific Northwest. For Christian faith communities, the Pacific Northwest is marked by a marginal position of social organization, and then also has a history of religious entrepreneurship. When combined, the marginal social position of religious organizations and the history of, of ecclesial entrepreneurship create a container to imagine the ways in which collaborative partnership can support the emerging forms that govern a community of faith and common life. This particular region provides a case to explore the emerging possibilities to organize a common life beyond the clutches of Christendom. And according to sociologist Mark Silk, it provides a context to explore the North American religious future. Moreover, the striking similarities and fundamental differences between these two cases provide an opportunity to consider how a turn to collaborative partnership was and is emerging simultaneously in the mainline tradition on the one hand and within the missional emergent tradition 
on the others. While these two strands of Protestantism shares many shared commitments and practices, they also frequently represent siloed sectors. And as communities of faith beyond the region consider how best to engage in collaboration and partnership, particularly in the wake of this pandemic time, these cases may provide a template for their work. Nevertheless, collaboration not only crosses traditions, but it also crosses sectors. So to this end, I, I realized that to study collaborative structures required a novel method and grammar to guide this work. Rather than studying a single type of religious organization, I wanted instead to study the points of contact and intersection between different organizations and their leaders. To this end, I identified the ecclesial ecology as the primary level of analysis. And by ecclesial ecology, I mean the identifiable, the constellation of identifiable forms of organized ecclesial life, such as congregations, theological schools, Christian colleges and universities, philanthropic centers and nonprofits, as well as experiments and expressions of creative deviance that occur on the edges and the boundary zones between existing and emerging orders. Taking cues from organizational studies, practical theology, and sociology, I then examined how the adaptive challenges catalyze partnership. This definition clarified the three primary foci for my work. I'll get that right one day. The empirical focus. The empirical focus became the ecclesial ecology in the Pacific Northwest. The conceptual focus became examining how adaptive challenges catalyze collaborative partnership. And then third and finally, the organizational focus was studying a novel organizational form, what I call a hub, that is distinguished by collaboration and partnership. Now back to hub. By hub, I mean a way of organizing religious life that is neither a megachurch nor a denomination. Rather, a hub is a densely networked organizational form that anchors religious life in a particular region and facilitates webs of connection across a broader ecclesial ecology. And as visualized here, hubs are densely re relational structures, not simply an organizational form alone. The connections that comprise them ground them and give them their animating purpose. For Christian leaders then in the shifting ecclesial ecology, collaboration marks their effort to form and sustain these hubs. Like blood pulsing through the veins of an ecclesial body, it animates and enlivens these richly creative, collaborative, and contextual efforts that are emerging in the region. So with these definitions in view, we can now consider the specific structure of collaboration that support and emerges from these new forms. And as I listened, observed, studied, and analyzed data, I realized that collaboration distinguishes their kindred work. My broader work and research, um, as explained in my forthcoming book, Adaptive Church, Collaboration and Community in a Changing World. Uh, Dr. Bramadat had the, had the right title until the, the editors got their hands on it and it changed, as I'm sure you all know well. Um, and and the, my, my forthcoming book, Adaptive Church, it tells the stories of these two hubs. Um, and I review their respective histories, catalog the challenges and values that they face. I locate each hub in their, their respective regions and geographies. I describe how this novel organizational form um, is emerging using insights from organizational theory. And then I consider the conditions of possibility that support this duly collaborative and imaginative work. And the time we have today, I wanna to focus on the critical, a critical condition of possibility for these adaptive hubs, collaborative partnership, which is the principal focus of chapter seven. In contrast to existing models of leadership and partnership that accent a particular role or position, leaders across these hubs describe their work as a form of presence. To this end, I wanna outline six different modes of collaborative partnership. Rather than a single expression of partnership, these modes of connection and partnership are connected by a virtuous pattern of connection and possibility. I'll describe each of these, noting how each mode of collaborative partnership 
includes a particular set of practices and identify a metaphor that grounds and guides this work. First, the caretaker. The caretaker holds the hopes and dreams and pains of a community, seeking to create the conditions where they may be formed and transformed through an encounter with God and community. This particular mode of being with emerges from a profound care for individuals in their collective well-being, and it affirms, affirms the abundance of resources that exist already in a given community. These individuals are often hosts for their communities. They enjoy having people in their homes, inviting people to their cities, inviting people to their local worshiping community, but they're also practiced at being a guest in others' spaces. They know how to enter a space in a way that leaves space for others. Their presence in each instance preserves and creates room for others. This individual then serves a broader ecclesial ecology as an organizational midwife. This is the metaphor, by creating space for new possibilities to come into being. Leading with hope, they tend to the fabric of care that guides a community. The catalyst. The catalyst is an entrepreneur who may inhabit the edges of organizations and institutions. An innovator in a position or an organization, she is a catalyst for the change that may redound to impact the broader ecclesial ecology. These individuals are starters, but not sustainers. Nevertheless, they have a restless discontent with the status quo, but they also have stayed engaged with their communities of faith, even as they work to change them. The catalyst organizing practices are innovating and ideating. They work in a way where they try to innovate in order to alter the conditions that support the life of faith. An ecclesial entrepreneur by practice, uh, this metaphor grounds their life and it expresses a form of tradition innovation as their particular expression of entrepreneurship draws wisdom from a broader tradition of creative praxis. Third, the champion. The champion's mode of being with energizes and elevates leadership by take that's taking place in diverse points across an ecclesial ecology. Champions are not possessive of their resources or potential. Rather, they leverage their position and privilege for the sake of others. Recognizing that other success enriches the entire ecology, they frequently give their time, presence, and praise a way to support others. Two organizing practices organize the champion's work elevating others and telling stories. They are master storytellers, holding an audience and rapt attention, but always so that others' accomplishments can be elevated and celebrated. The metaphor of a player coach describes and captures the champion's particular mode of partnership. Much as a player coach combines wisdom that comes from lived experience with the ability to encourage and inspire action at critical junctures, champions have experience drawn from playing the game, and they also know how to coordinate others' actions and collaboration for the good of their communities. Fourth, the connector-convener. Connector-conveners pursue a mode of partnership with individuals and communities by tending to the connective sinews that comprise an ecclesial ecology. These individuals who are acutely aware of the disconnection and polarization that marks many of their communities, understand the importance of shared text and context. And they then work to provide mediums for individuals to meet and connect. Like the upstroke and downstroke of a bicycle pedal, their work as connectors, conveners, is guided by the dual action of connection and convening. Rather than separate practices, these are interrelated practices that build momentum and energy for the change they try to achieve in their community. Furthermore, the practices of asking questions and listening express the connector convener's distinct mode of leadership. They have the ability to ask questions that activate agency and listen in ways that draws out the wisdom and passion that is already latent in others. The metaphor of a conductor clarifies the practical wisdom that directs the connectors, conveners, distinct mode of being with individuals and communities. 
Like a conductor orchestrating, directing and orchestrating an orchestra, the connector convener knows how, has the know-how that enables her to gather and coordinate diverse voices, experiences, and perspectives. Fifth, the surveyor. The surveyor pursues a form of partnership that first attends to the system of connections and ideas that comprise an ecology. The surveyor then seeks to translate insights for the good of the community. Surveyors may have some academic training, but this particular posture is not exclusively expressed by academics. Rather, this particular mode of partnership is expressed in two practices, investigation and translation. Like a community librarian, which is the organizing metaphor, the surveyor trades in concepts and text. Thinkers and ideas are like friends to them. They assume a life of their own and fill the surveyor's idle thoughts. Further, they know the text of various bodies of knowledge and have the ability to guide others as they explore the relevance of text and concepts in relation to the challenges they face. Guided by care and curiosity, they are able to offer a word on point for the good of their community and the advancement of a particular, the particular collaborations religious life requires. Six, and finally, the guide. The final form of being with the guide reflects a posture of coming alongside individuals and communities amid the uncertainty that characterizes change. Mentors, spiritual directors, and life coaches express a certain aspects of this particular form of being with. However, the guide's mode of partnership bears something more. Guides have a perspective that enables them to see the whole and the well-worn wisdom about the conditions for and activities that can start and sustain change. A guide's posture reflects two organizing practices, coming alongside and discerning the next steps. Without prescribing the outcomes, they simply create and hold space for those in their care to discern how best to navigate a shifting ecclesial ecology. Virgil's, Virgil from Dante's The Divine Comedy provides a guiding metaphor for their work. Much like Virgil, who journeys alongside Dante from hell to purgator purgatory, ultimately to paradisio, um, the guide is a patient presence that invites those they are with to discern and navigate the next step. Fittingly, as many of you undoubtedly know, by the comedy's conclusion, Virgil no longer accompanies Dante. Rather, Dante has found his footing to move with certainty, but he still lives and learns in relation to others. While each of these forms of partnership express a particular orientation to others, I have yet to describe the actual structure of collaborative partnership. To this end, I wanna describe three forms of collaborative partnership, leadership team, polarities, and axes of innovation. First, leadership teams describe the particular configuration of partnership that is required to live and lead in different environments. In spaces marked by a high degree of uncertainty and fluidity, what I call an ambiguous set of organizational arrangements, partnerships between catalyst, guides, and connector conveners may advance the work of this, this particular environment requires. And this is visualized in the green. Connector conveners contribute to this work through their well-worn wisdom for how to gather and connect individuals, resources, and communities to activate change. Meanwhile, catalysts has a rest, have a restless discontent and a desire to activate change within their communities, especially in the space of incredible ambiguity. And then finally, guides who have the ability to see the system in which the envisioned change can take place, they are able to, innate, they are able to guide catalysts and connector conveners to take the next step and the next one and the next one as they pursue their change they envision. In environments marked by more clarity and firmer organizational boundaries, what I call a fixed set of organizational arrangements, caretakers, champions, and surveyors often partner together in order to pursue change. With existing partnerships and processes in place, caretakers are required to care for the individuals and structures that are already gathered in place. 
Meanwhile, champions advance the work that is already going on by, having, by leveraging their access to resources and storytelling in order to advance this work. And then finally, surveyors' relationally embedded review of the landscape enables them to name the emerging needs of a community and suggest tradition-worn responses. In other instances, individuals collaborate with those who lead out of a primary mode that occupies the polar expression. I call this type of collaboration polarities. Like the gravitational poles that hold a large mass, mass such as the Earth together, these polar expressions bind different forms of partnership together in ways that enrich the entire ecclesial ecology. To this end, guides, caretakers, surveyors, catalysts, and connect, champions and connectors, conveners readily find themselves engaged in co conversation and collaboration with the other. Representing more than strategic partnerships between complementary expressions, these individuals often find their work bound together by something stronger than mere partnership, namely friendship. To return to Bob, who is a classic catalyst, by the way. Uh, he talks about his long history with somebody who leads as a surveyor. He says, quote, I consider him in the circle of some of my best friends. Repeatedly across each other, I heard stories of not just abiding partnership, but deep friendship that emerges over decades. And it was out of this friendship, this partnership, this collaboration, that these organizations were able to imagine and pursue collaborative responses to the challenges they face. In a similar way, these polar partnerships guide the particular kind of collaboration that founds and emerges across these hubs. Hmm, that didn't appear properly. Let's see. Imagine that this is overlaid on that. With me? Great. Finally, this collaborative work is organized around four shared values. I identify these as axes of innovation, care, change, connection, and co-mission. An axis of care joins the particular partnership caretakers and guides pursue. You can see this here. Moved by an abundance of care for the communities they serve, they are drawn out into partnership with others. Change unifies the partnership catalyst and surveyors pursue. Although they see and, serve, see and serve the ecology from different levels of abstraction, they each envision and work for change, which in turn draws them into partnership with others and together. Champions and connector conveners, the vertical line, share an axis of connection. Reaching across silos that mark an ecclesial ecology, they draw others into a more collaborative, common life. When combined and expressed in localized manners, each of these modes of being with expresses a commitment to co-mission. This is visualized on the outside. Their shared commitment to collaboration as a way of life represents a vision to body forth a more connected and collaborative body politic one that can transform the very structures of belonging. When combined, these leaders attempt to be with one another in ways that release collective capacity. And according to organizers and participants across these hubs, they are nothing less than an attempt to, quote, reimagine church. This description, however, stops short of exploring a fundamental question for scholars of religion and theology. Namely, how is this particular constellation of relationships I've described here embedded in a broader community of practice that is full of divine symbols and the possibilities of encounter with God? In order to answer this question, I want to sketch a particular account of a way of life that both coheres with these local practices and constructively extends their collaborative work. I will do so in relation to a particular tradition, Protestant Christianity, uh, because participants across both hubs draw from this well. And although it's beyond the scope of this particular research and conversation, um, it does bear noting that resources in other Christian 
and non-Christian traditions also offer resources to sustain similar collaborative partnerships. By way of life, I mean a habit of being marked by a sense of belonging and purpose that places individuals as actors within a local community of practice. Uh, please be allow me to say more about some of these key terms. Habit of being describes the way in which a way of life is more often absorbed through partic participation than from rationaliza rationalization. It is a pre-reflective habitus, as Bourdieu may note, that emerges in and through an encounter with a broader social environment. And a way of life emerges when individuals find and, encounter, find and encounter a sense of belonging and purpose. Although some have described the way of life in relation to community, we actually need a thicker description, I think. And accordingly, belonging expresses the ways individuals find themselves connected to and valued by others. Purpose then conveys a sense that one's work and life has meaning beyond one's self. Further, a way of life also places people. It roots individuals in the particularities of the social space and situations they, where they find themselves and also connects them trans-historically across time and space. Far from an abstract notion of meaning and identity, the way of life assumes a contextualized form. And much as people in the Pacific Northwest have known long before these two hubs emerged, it is impossible to come to a full understanding of meaning, purpose, and identity without rooting ourselves in the particulars of place. And when placed, individuals can then become actors. Accordingly, a way of life activates agency, infusing activity with moral purpose and providing a catalog of values to guide individual and collective activity. When combined in this way, a way of life embeds people within a particular local social community of practice. Such a structure is marked by goods internal to the community and a tradition understanding of the values that can guide a common life. With this definition in mind, let's return to the stories of these two collaborative hubs. Their work emerged first in response to the shifting organizational environments that mark religious life within and beyond the region. Like many others, they faced the challenges of shifting denominational bodies, loneliness, financial pressures, polarization, and the demands of increasingly isolated and digital age. What has emerged, however, is more than a strategic intervention bent on capturing a shrinking market share. Rather, the particular type of collaborative partnership they pursue represents an attempt to pursue and craft a distinctive way of life. Stories from organizers and participants express the wisdom that guides this particular way of life. Allow me to name just a few. Let's consider the initial story from Bob. As he talked about the importance of partnership, that we really are better together, he can't help but locate his work in relation to others in a broader sense of purpose. Without ignoring the real and unmistakable challenges that confront local church communities and especially church startups and church plants, he's begun to imagine something more. I almost feel like my calling is to change the mind of the church, he notes, and he's committed to doing so in the company of others. And as he talks, it's as if anxiety gives way to possibility. There is a new way. And then there is Tim. Tim is a key organizer in the Parish Collective, which seeks to reground the church in the neighborhood. A Tim describes the level of commitment and investment in their work in this way. Quote, I mean, all of us are giving our lives to this, these ideas at some level. We're in it. We don't necessarily know how to go about it at all the time, but we are in it. With clarity and commitment, for Tim, collaboration is both the medium and the means to discern what faithfulness looks like in a particular place. And reflecting the dually 
individual and collective character of the way of life I've sketched here, his speech often uses I and we interchangeably. It is nearly as if the richly collaborative work that he pursues alongside others has worked its way so deeply into him and into his imagination that it is now impossible to think about, much less speak about, the first person I without also locating an individual with and within a broader community. Or consider Reed, uh, who's one of the lone ministry leaders that I spoke with from Vancouver, Canada, who has spent the last 10 years trying to be faithfully present to the needs of her local community. She notes, I've had leadership titles my whole life, but I no longer have business cards. And even when I speak, I don't use any of those because it's intriguing to me that neighbor and homemaker are true roles that have never been professionalized, not like pastors been. And then later in our conversation, she shares, it's just like a family. You can't approach a family that way in the way that you structure relationships and how you even nurture your life together. And it's very messy, intuitive, relational work that's not done by experts. For Reed and so many others, the particular way of life that grounds their work in and beyond the Pacific Northwest is something that emerges out of relational presence and proximity. It's first the connect work of friendship and connection and care long before it's the work of paid ministerial professionals. And as Tim note, they're committing their lives to this work. And while in many ways, this particular way of life um, is claimed to be novel by some, organizers are also keen to note the ways in which they are drawing wisdom from a deep well of tradition practice. For example, Jerry, who is a key organizer of the Office of Church Engagement, notes how the early Christian way of life was marked by a distinct, if not also peculiar social witness that led to the transformation of individuals, communities, and cities. He writes, quote, early Christians believed that the church embodied a new oikumen, a new household, only of a very different kind from Rome. There's something profoundly audacious about this claim. And emerging from such a sensibility, Sitzer and others are working to craft the organizational environment of the OCE in a way that actually creates a new household, a new structure and they're mindful of the ways in which there's something audacious about their claim. In each case, collaborative partnership represents an attempt to craft and renew a particular way of life. The way of life that is envisioned and modeled by these hubs emerges out of and alongside of alternative structures they craft. Moreover, the proximity of these experiences to dense networks of social relations and common purposes contains a possibility for formation and possibly even transformation. Amid this great uh, unraveling in American religious life, the way of life, their way of life acknowledges the complex challenges that confront local communities of faith, but it also bears forth wisdom from the womb of belonging. These hubs may kindle hope for a new day. No doubt listeners gathered here and possibly online are wondering about the impact of COVID-19 on these particular ecclesial innovations. Um, as pictured here, this is uh, an image from the OCE's annual gathering uh, that was done all remotely and is filmed here. Um, and in similar ways, other ecclesial experiments were disrupted as well. Uh, but nonetheless, when I interviewed and met with a subsample of leaders in the wake of COVID, they expressed how the various challenges that they faced um, in the pandemic, while they are real and unmistakable and severe, they did not fundamentally alter the challenges that they face. In some spaces, as one leader noted, the pandemic made some things easier, especially collaboration. So as we continue to unravel the story of how this particular crisis may impact other faith communities, I wanna suggest that fragility and possibility are conjoined. And as we conclude, I wanna tell a story about one ministry leader I met in which fragility and possibility are Jessica. conjoined, Jessica. Jessica is a neighborhood pastor in a community in Northern Seattle. 
She intentionally moved into the neighborhood several years ago and has been working to connect people of faith in her local community. She's a classic catalyst, creative, catalytic, and restlessly discontent with the status quo. When I first met her in 2019, she was upbeat and optimistic. Ministry was hard, uh, but she described her work as, quote, living into the tensions of going for something we don't see. She's an ecclesial entrepreneur. But when I talked to her again in February 2021, nearly a year into this pandemic, she was weary. It had been a hard year, and yet she had an unshakable sense of what is possible. She shared. We are limited in that, and that feels really hard, that the thing that we really love to do is to be present to people. But I'm still so convinced that God is at work, even though really, in the natural, I mean, there's not a lot to be super excited about. You can hear in these brief comments the hesitancy, the stutter, uh, the degree of uncertainty that she inhabits. Nevertheless, even when it's not shiny, shareable, and is profoundly ordinary, she's committed and convinced that God is at work. Something new is possible. And then she said this, and in a hopeless world, there is hope and all things are possible. New things are possible. New things that we never thought were possible are now possible. For Jessica and others across these hubs and possibly even other faith communities across the region, the nation, and possibly even the world, even when it feels like the world is turned upside down, in this moment, new things that we never thought were possible are now possible. Fragility and possibility meet and mingle in this moment in profound and enduring ways. In conclusion, in the ordinary places and spaces across the Pacific Northwest, collaborative partnerships are giving rise to a particular way of life. On Tuesday mornings in Seattle, on Tuesday mornings in Spokane and in Seattle neighborhoods, people are learning what it means to be better together. Within established and emerging organizational structures, there's a shared movement for a more connected and interconnected way of life. And even as these leaders remain connected to the Christian tradition, they are actively and self-consciously working to reimagine church. And they're doing so precisely by re-weaving the structure of belonging that grounds a common life. Their work and the wisdom that marks their collaborative partnerships is remaking how leaders and local communities of faith imagine what is possible, especially through collaborative partnership. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dustin. So we have about 10 minutes for conversation questions which can come either from you guys here or from the Zoom uh, group. Then Rachel will wave to me if someone on Zoom poses a question. So I'll grab my... Yeah, Graham. Yes, clearly, thank you. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you. So I, I would say there's, there's kind of two different levels uh, of thinking about how these, uh, these concepts traffic in uh, these two, two organizations. First, there's uh, what I'll call kind of the local, the local level, uh, 
uh, where individuals oftentimes talk about the, the particular household, their particular family, those who are gathered in their local community um, as a particular unit that grounds religious life, uh, particularly ecclesial life in a particular neighborhood. Uh, this is expressed more profoundly um, in the work of, of the parish collective than it is in the Office of Church Engagement. Nonetheless, there's intent in both cases uh, to think about the, the primary unit of transformation um, as a um, small unit, whether it's a small group or a family or a local community of practice. Um, and then secondly, there's the level of the organization. Um, and I would say at the level of the organization, they are less uh, likely to use the language of, of family and household than they are to think about the work as, um, as a movement and as a structure. Um, and each, play, each case, I think what provides unity and continuity throughout this work um, is first the priority of place. Um, people across local communities, local families, and these organizational structures are located in a particular geography and they're mindful of that geography and are trying to create the structures to support and sustain that work. Um, and then secondly, the other thing people are mindful of is the uh, degree of, of isolation, um, even within families and households. Uh, so they're trying to create spaces in which individuals uh, can be, be more connected, uh, less polarized, um, and do so in congregations and local communities um, and their families as well. Um, I think about this, the, the mechanism in terms of, of belonging. So in both the um, local unit, uh, whether it's the family and the household, as well as the broader structure, I think what they have in common is they're trying to pursue a particular structure of belonging um, that is unified by a number of shared values. Of course. Yeah, it's a good, interesting question. Um, I would say that uh, the particular way of life makes different demands of the pastor and what we might call the, not just the parishioner, but uh, the person who is engaged in the community of faith in some way, uh, whether that's a highly engaged way as some type of leader or somebody who's just what we might call an inquirer. Um, it, it makes different demands, but it offers a similar invitation. Um, and I think in both instances, it's the invitation to see the life of faith beyond a professional model of church leadership um, in a way that uh, actually identifies the vibrancy of a religious community precisely through its connections and through the collaborations that comprise that. So for the pastor, that requires a very different way of imagining what leadership looks like and how you express it. Uh, the pastor is no longer just the preacher, the sage on a stage, uh, particularly a charismatic one. Um, you all know the, the stories of charismatic leaders in this region, you know, probably better than I do. I mean, many of the leaders in this region are, are in this, this study were mindful of their ways, but they were not that. Um, so it invites something different of the pastor, but simultaneously it actually demands something different of people who are engaged. It invites them to be active participants in leading, serving, um, organizing their common life. I mean, this actually is reflected in broader research uh, about the shifting nature of religious, religious communities um, and the, the need for lay leadership as we move beyond kind of a professional model of pastoral leadership. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, I think the invitation to them is that you belong here um, and you belong here in a way that uh, is not just consuming religious content, but actually contributing to it. Uh, and that your, your questions, your participation, your very presence and particularity is something that is needed for us to imagine what it's actually like to be better together. Hello, um, I'm Connie Alsop. 
Uh, question is, what do you envision as partnerships for church congregations beyond the coffee shop or other churches? Yeah, that's a really interesting, uh, interesting question, Connie. Um, and I, I had to spend a fair bit of time thinking about how, how to map and track partnership uh, throughout this work. And uh, the first thing I'll say is, is one of the things that I wanted to do was, was study the partnerships beyond just congregations. Um, although congregations are a central feature of the ecclesial ecology, I was actually mindful of the whole host of other organizations that are gathered around this ecology. So the individuals I, I interviewed were not just pastors, uh, they're nonprofit leaders, they're educators, they're deans, they're um, philanthropic leaders. Um, so the first thing I would say is that, that there's partnerships between a whole host of organizations that grounds and guides this work. Um, and secondly, I think there's, there's a host of different ways to think about what partnership actually looks like. Uh, some of the leaders talked about this in the distinction between thick and thin partnership. Um, so partnership that is, is thinner uh, would be something like uh, we um, oftentimes gather together regularly for some type of breakfast. breakfast. Uh, we get together in a regular way. A thicker form of partnership oftentimes requires some type of exchange or transaction. They give students, they give money. There's actually some type of formal partnership that's in place. I mean, one of the striking things that's unique about these two cases is they're navigating this partnership in different ways. Whereas the parish collective has uh, a broader network, the actual structures of that partnership um, are a little bit thinner. Um, however, well, thinner in some ways, and there's a, a lower bar of entry in terms of financial transaction. Um, for the Office of Church Engagement, they're trying to have these thick partnership that includes multiple forms of contact. In each case, however, friendship is oftentimes the seed and the source of partnership, such that these partnerships emerge out of decades of presence in the community and leaders' ability to connect with others across the region. Sure. Thank you. We don't have much time, unfortunately, and this is a, a broad question, so forgive me for uh, asking it last. So you have to answer in a haiku. Um, the question is really, what, does, what is particular about the Pacific Northwest for these phenomena? Because in some ways, your, your lecture, if you just took out the words Pacific Northwest and, and Cascadia, could be about anywhere in North America. Right. But is there something about this place, this region, mm -hmm. that makes the dynamics you're tracing Different. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say two things. One, the marginal social position for religious organizations. Um, by virtue of where social religious organizations are placed, um, they uh, occupy a marginal social position such that uh, if they are to get anything done, um, there's oftentimes a need to collaborate and partner with others. Um, and the second thing I would say is um, there are as I read it, uh, more permeable denominational boundaries. So on the one hand, there is um, a need to partner in order to get work done. And then secondly, in some communities, some um, denominational traditions, there's more porous denominational boundaries where uh, they just don't mean as much as they do in other parts of religion. So there are fewer barriers to partnership in order to get work done. A little bit. <laughs> Thanks very much. Please uh, join me in thanking Dustin for that talk. And uh, next week, as you'll see from the PowerPoint slide, uh, we have a special lecture. It's a one of our Lansdowne lectures. So please join us next week for that for Karen Myers. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. See you next week. <laughs>